That's a good segue to uh, the current sermon series we're in that we've entitled Co-Mission, that we are called to participate in God's mission together to seek and save the lost. We're invited to make disciples, teaching them everything that Jesus is teaching us, and that certainly comes more than anything through imitating Christ trying to be his hands and his feet, bringing his love, his spirit everywhere we go. And I want to remind us, the church, by definition, uh, the word is ecclesia, called out to be different, called out to be the light, to stand out in our values, in our way of life. Jesus said, I am the way. And the first Christians were called the people of the way. And today, we're going to be reminded exactly what Jesus means by being the way. This is the way to live your life. We are turning from being our own lords, our own gods, to Jesus' way of living. And on this Father's Day, I want to remind us it starts in the home. That if we're not being Jesus within our family unit and making disciples at home, we certainly can't do it outside of our home. And we especially need it in our marriage if we're deflated from our spouse instead of encouraged by our spouse, it's going to be hard to go outside of our home and be a light in the world. And so we want to pay special attention to what Jesus has to say about in our home and then working our way out into our neighborhoods, networks, and beyond to know, show, and share Jesus about the way of Christ. And so if you'll read with me right now in Luke chapter 6, verse 31 through 38, we have it on the overhead, about the way of Christ that we can seek him to help us to do likewise. He says, do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners, even people far from God love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you'll only lend to those whom you expect repayment, and especially today in this culture, repayment with interest, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who don't do good to you. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High God, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Even his enemies, those who are being their own God and going their own way and rebelling against the way of Christ, God is not treating them as their sins deserve. The wage of sin is death. He's still giving them life and space and time to repent. He's still pursuing relationship with them, not wanting anyone to perish apart from knowing him as their Father goes on to say this, do not judge, and you will not be judged. That is, motives and intentions. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. None of this, you can just go to hell then and and treat people as though I'm done with you. Forgive, and you will be forgiving, asking Jesus to help you release punishment into his hands. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. That's pretty empowering, isn't it? Jesus says the measure that you're able to receive and give is what you'll get. You know, on this Father's Day, we're in a time of crisis in this nation, and I don't want to start on a negative note, but to deal with root issues, you kind of got to face the issue head on for what it is. And since 1968, the number of children without fathers has doubled in this nation to 18 and a half million children. In my generation, I'm 40 years old, there's more of us without a father in the home than who grew up with a father in the home. Of 100 countries surveyed, the United States has the highest percentage of fatherlessness, 300% higher than the global average. We desperately, desperately need God the Father in heaven to teach us once again 
what it is to be a father in our homes for the sake of our nation, for the sake of the next generation, for the sake of legacies to come. I was thinking as, Lace, as Casey was leading us this morning and he was sharing about his grandfather, it made me think about uh, not only my father who is here and who's just such a wonderful man, but my grandfather's as well. Somebody who knows my dad who had him as a pastor uh, in the back. Yes, there's lots to applaud. He's even better father than a pastor, believe it or not. And I was thinking of uh, another friend who was influential, just like a father too, who didn't have the privileges my dad and I had of a godly father, but a, a string of alcoholic fathers in his life who then came to his father in heaven and broke the cycle. Now his son is living for Jesus Christ, and he just had a child who's going to be living for Jesus Christ. And how one person who turns to our father in heaven can change a whole legacy and generations to come. And it starts here in our church and in our homes that if people cannot respect what they see in our marriages, what they see in our parenting, what they see on a day-to-day basis, then they certainly are not going to be looking to God. They're always asking themselves, what difference does Jesus make anyways? Is it practical? Can I see it in your life? You know, anyone who's done marriage counseling will tell you that one of the common phrases that continually comes up is this, we've grown apart. We've grown apart. And the sense of intimacy and closeness we once had, it's just not there And of course, this can be true of every relationship in our lives, including our relationship with God. Our relationship with God, if, if it's not tended to, if we're not proactive in it, our relationship in marriage, our relationship with our kids, everything takes intentionality. Everything takes um, being proactively intentional to make space and room for if it's going to be cultivated and strong. And if we neglect it, the natural inclination is to drift apart until one day you wake up and you go, man, I don't even know if I know this person, like this person, want to continue with this person. And so if you're taking notes, I want to speak to an acronym that Jesus speaks to in this passage that can help us if we feel we've grown apart from God, if we feel we've grown apart in our marriage, if we feel like we've grown apart from our kids, of how we can get back into close relationship again and how we can remain there and abide there, not just for our sake, not just for the joy that it brings us because we were made for intimacy with God and one another, but for the greater witness and the greatest good, greater good of others who are without hope who don't know there's a Father in heaven that's there to source them with supernatural love, to help them to stay faithful in their marriage and faithful in the family. And so on the back of your bulletin, there's a place to take notes, and I want you to write down this acronym SERVE. Vertically, not horizontally, SERVE. And I got this from Jimmy Evans, who, who runs the, the largest marriage ministry in the world, in, in the United States. Um, S speaks to serve your spouse's need. Serve your spouse's need. You know, it's so easy to just serve out of what comes natural to us. My wife and I dealt with this a lot in our marriage. See, I am someone who, who's very affectionate. And she was raised British, and if you know anything about British people, they're just not naturally affectionate. Um, and so I'm all touchy-feely, and she's, and I'm thinking I'm being loving in that. I'm assuming that what I need is what she needs, and of course, occasionally she wants a hug, uh, but it wasn't like, like me. It's like, man, you're kind of clean. Man, get off me. It's hot out here. You know, what are you doing? You know, what good does it do for your spouse or those around you if you're just assuming the need, but you're not actually meeting the need? See, for her, she needs quality time and words of affirmation. And so here I am trying to meet a need, thinking I'm meeting a need, thinking, you know, you should be so happy with me with how loving I am. And it's like, well, you're just being clean. So I just want to start with the obvious of love your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus says. 
To, to love someone as you want to be loved, it starts with you want somebody to know what needs you actually have, not what needs they have. And we so naturally just love out of what's natural to us that sometimes we forget that people are different from us and we're not actually meeting the needs around us even though we have good intentions. Or maybe even if we do have good intentions because so often we don't. And so we start to grow apart because we're both coming in with wrong assumptions of even what the need is. And we're not even willing to maybe ask or have self-sacrifice that's needed to actually meet what the true need is. And you know, in Jesus' time, when he comes on the scene of human history, there was this idea already in place before the golden rule that said this, what you do not want done to yourself do not do to others. And that's a good ethic. But Jesus here, he flips the script for us, and he says, in a positive way, what you do want done, do to others. It's not just that you have to have patience and self-control as to not negatively affect people, which you definitely need, but you also, according to Jesus, need to proactively seek their best interest because that's how God works with us. Aren't you grateful that God pursues, he seeks after a relationship with us continually? He's not just passive, he's proactively seeking to draw us near to himself and meet our need. And he draws each one of us exactly according to our personalities and makeups. In the same way, then, he wants us to be considerate, starting in the home and working our way out, of what is the need, the actual need that I can meet. And his Holy Spirit dwells within us to help us to see it and to do it. And so we can't just assume we know our spouse's needs and we need to, if we're going to fulfill the way of Christ in our homes, to start there. Let the spouse define the need. And by the way, you have to let them define success. And, and there's certainly a, a dance in this because it takes time. If your spouse needs something that's not natural to you, you can't just flip a switch and it's going to happen overnight. And so the other thing, of course, that we need is to be patient with each other and, and give each other credit for the efforts that we see as we try to grow new muscles in working with God and the Holy Spirit prayerfully to say, How, Lord, help me to actually meet the need of my spouse. Go back, going back to Jesus' words again, starting in verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? If you lend to those with whom you expect repayment, what credit is there for you? But rather, you've got to love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. What's the daily temptation for all of us? The daily temptation is, well, I will serve the other according to how they serve me. When they're good to me, I'll be good to them. You know, Courtney, Father, she hasn't been too thoughtful of my needs. And, and you know, she seems neglectful of me and how easy it is to kind of get into this pity party and, and so much spiritual warfare comes into our marriage because we get these thoughts. We, we learn from Jesus that our enemy in the spiritual realm, he's called the accuser of the brethren. He's like a prosecuting attorney. And he's more than happy to, for us to build a case against our spouse of all that they are not doing for us. But Jesus is calling us to get our focus off of our spouse and onto him. He says, I didn't call you to treat them the way they treat you. I called you to treat them the way that I've treated you. Your focus is off. Your focus needs to daily come back to me and the cross I bore for you in order to encourage you to pick up your cross for me and for them. And so Jesus calls us not to have a critical fault-finding spirit, but to give our spouses the benefit of the doubt. If they're crabby, not copying an attitude, but rather cop, you know, seeking curiously, hey, you doing all right? What's going on in your life? You know, one of the things that uh, I don't always do well, but has really helped us, for example, is to just understand and have mercy for each other's makeups. Like, when I wake up, it takes me 
some time and some coffee and some prayer to be real talkative. Courtney, man, she wakes up, she doesn't need coffee, she's just ready to go, and she's firing in all cylinders. I mean, it's, um, I, I'm a, I have envy. There's no doubt about it. It's amazing to me. And so it takes a great amount of patience in her that when I'm waking up, I'm like half groggy, and ha- I'm, not, I'm not at full attention. Remember, quality time means listening and affirmation. And words of affirmation, I don't have any words of affirmation right out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. I felt so isolated, so quiet in here. Like, ah, a lot of tension in this room. And then when I'm coming home from work, if I've been dealing with people and, and talking a lot, you know, I don't have the amount of capacity of words that Courtney has. And it's like I've spent sometimes my words at work and so coming home i just need a little detox time it's really helped me to tell her that in advance to to not just have her assume that when i walk through the door uh, i'm ready and prepared to have that time of engagement that she needs but rather it's like okay i've had a long day i'm going to need about 20 minutes to detox and and to collect myself through the door To, to set the expectation to work on meeting each other's needs and to have mercy as our father has mercy and and allowing us in our different makeups to figure out how to best serve each other with the love that we've received from Christ. So agape love, it's important to remember how God loves us, this word agape, it's a choice of the will. It's not connected to our emotion. So there's going to be times you don't feel like loving your spouse. Just like, did you know there's times that God doesn't necessarily like the way you're acting? but he still chooses to love you anyways. Jesus didn't feel like picking up his cross. He had to wrestle with the Father over it, saying, Father, if there's any other way but this way. But he chose to pick up that cross anyway for the joy set before him. And what I'm saying to you is, if you want to remain close to God and close to your spouse and become all that he has for you, you can't live on your feelings. And when people say, I don't even know what to pray for, just read this passage and you ought to, know, you ought to get desperate in prayer because the standard is Jesus. And Jesus has a high standard of his perfect love. And so even when I don't feel like it, I can choose to love my spouse. I can set my will and ask Jesus to help me to do the right thing and, and my emotions will often catch up. But if I'm just living in this quid pro quo world where if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, our marriage is just going to naturally grow apart rather than closer together. If I have a critical finding spirit that's not giving my spouse the benefit of the doubt, I'm not reflecting my father in heaven. I'm being a bad example of the father to my kids in the way that I example Christ within this marriage. And so agape love is choosing to love as God has loved us, whether our emotions there or not. It's a setting of our mind to do the right thing even when we don't feel like it. The E of serve is enjoy serving with a joyful attitude. (laughs) All right, I'll set my mind to do it. I'll go huffing and puffing, kicking, and I'll make sure that everybody feels the tension. Look, I'm doing the right thing for you. Do it with a grateful heart. Do it out of love for Christ. <laughs> Thank you. Go little golf play. You know, I have been uh, reading recently uh, a business book where it's talking about how the best businesses today train their employees to say, my pleasure, to keep it in a positive uh, rather than no problem. Now it's my pleasure. It's a positive. It's like, you're doing me a privilege to serve you. Have you ever been with somebody in in a restaurant or a setting where it's almost like um, punishment that they're serving you? Where they just act like, "Ah, what do you want? Got better things to do. It's like, man, are they paying you? Could you fake it at least for me here? And now you want a tip for everything too. But how often 
we would be offended if, if, if a waiter or a waitress is waiting on us and they're huffing and puffing and going, all right, can you get on with it? Did you pick it already? Jeez, you're taking forever here looking at the menu. Got better things to do. Or imagine you're, you're getting served and you order something and you're like, really, pizza? Is that the choice? Why don't you go with the salad? It looks like you've had enough pizza already, right? See, we, we would be so offended to have that experience in a corporate setting, but with those that are closest to us, in our home, where we most are to set the example of Christ, so often we make our spouse feel like their needs and serving their needs are such an inconvenience. <sighs> again, this is why you want to have this conversation again. Or in a conversation where somebody's just needing to vent and feel affirmed, where it's like, all right, get on with it. All right, I got better things to do than to serve you right now. I got my own agenda here. And I'm not trying to be harsh or cruel. We've all been there. We can all relate to giving the impression and receiving the impression that we're an inconvenience and we're not the priority. And what I want to remind us here, church, is that with Jesus, the priority is always people. That is the priority. And I hear people all the time now say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And Jesus would say, if you're truly spiritual, you're going to be religious about serving other people's needs. And it starts in our homes. And it starts with not only hearing the need and, and making sure that we're meeting the need, but that we're looking to do it with joy and with pleasure as unto the Lord. Because it, it's not just our spouse that we're serving. We're serving Jesus and serving our spouse. If we love Jesus... We're going to love our spouse. You're never doing better with Jesus than you're doing with your spouse. Remember, gentlemen, Peter tells us, for the sake of our prayers not being hindered, live with your wives in an understanding way. Don't grow bitter against your wife because it will hinder your prayers with God. Now, I don't know about you, but that causes me to want to overcome feelings of displeasure and make sure I work through it with my wife because I always want to make sure God is attentive to my prayers. In other words, Jesus isn't, he's not making it optional. He's saying, you have to, to be at peace with me, you've got to work to be at peace with your spouse. Now, it takes two to tango, as they say. But as far as it depends on you, have you done everything you can to humble yourself and to seek to be at peace? Not keeping a record of all that they're doing wrong, but asking yourself, but what have I done wrong? You're never going to give an accounting for what your spouse did before God. You're going to give an accounting for what you did before God. And Jesus is reminding of that, us of that here. The R of serve is to reject scorekeeping. <laughs> you ever get into a volley with your spouse of scorekeeping? Jesus says, the measure you use with others will be measured back to you. Aren't you grateful God doesn't keep a record of our wrongs? You want to keep score. In other words, the gospel changes everything. The revelation of Jesus changes everything about scorekeeping, doesn't it? Because the scorekeeping of how often we have fallen short and gone our own way with Jesus, if we don't want him to, to use that against us conveniently, he says, listen, I'm more than happy to cast your sin as far as the east is from the west from you. I just ask you to do the same for my other children whom I love. I'm not asking you to do anything for others that I haven't first done for you. All of us who have been married for any amount of time are continually tempted when it's convenient to pull up something from the past and go, remember? And God says, I want you to work with me to be done with that. And that doesn't mean that, of course, things don't take time to build trust back if there's been great betrayal and things of that nature where, of course, it's going to take time and patience to work through things over time. We just well, what's wrong with you bringing that up again? You should just forget. Well, it's like, no, you can't just forget something like that. But that over time, you're working not to punish the person with it. That punishment in God's, is in God's hand. And of course, that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. God's not going to call us to do something that he doesn't want to help us with 
And I just want to remind us, we can't fight fire with fire. You're only going to get a bigger fire. (laughs) So Jesus wants us to be proactively trying to be an example of redemptive love to each other, not operating out of a point system. That's what every other religion is about. Every other religion of of Christianity is trying to get your good works to outweigh your bad works and just hope that, that that's enough for God, that you could appease God. But Christianity says, no, that's not how it works with God. God is a father in heaven who so loved the world that while we were in rebellion against him, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give us a clean slate of mercy. We don't come, we come empty-handed. We come as poor beggars. We say, I got nothing to offer you, God, and we throw ourselves in his mercy, and he says, I have everything to offer you, and I give you mercy as a free gift. There's no point system in Christianity. We come empty hand. We say, God, save me, a wretched sinner. I've got nothing good in me. And he says, I'll give you my Holy Spirit and my nature. I'll pour all my goodness into you. And it's from that ground zero mercy, not sacrifice, that we build our lives with one another, starting in our home and working our way out in our neighborhoods, networks, and beyond. And that's what keeps us close. What keeps us close is we're continually practicing mercy. We're continually practicing grace that we've received. We're praying together. If you do not pray together regularly, I, I, I implore you to do so. You would be amazed at what prayer together does on a daily basis. And keeping your hearts close together and keeping you out of this place of keeping score. The V of serve is vigilantly protecting the priority of your marriage. And see, this really speaks to that last point I just said about making time. You've got to protect time. Relationships require time. It's easy to drift apart because you're not being intentional to take the time to connect. And so one of the most precious times we have in our lives is in the evenings when we sit down together at the end of a day and we start with prayer and then we talk, and then we'll usually enjoy a show together. I won't tell you those shows because they're usually terrible shows, but they're mindless and kind of entertaining. But, but just making intentional time to talk and to share and to pray, it keeps us close. And that might be different for everybody based on your schedules. It might have to be in the morning. It might be, have to be at lunch. It might have to be... In the, but the, you need to daily make the time investment to stay close and, and this is where kids also have to be taught to respect your marriage, right? Because kids, they want to own everything. They want to own your soul. They want to take up all the time. They want to be the center of the universe. That's what, that's what makes us born uh, sinners, right? Is, is we want to be the center, not God and others. And so that has to be trained into our children that, hey, I'm sorry, you're not God. You're not the center, I have a lifetime commitment to your mom. You're a temporary assignment. And so I've got to train you to respect this. You can't just come busting and interrupt without stopping and considering what's going on. I need to train that into you. And so, you know, you got to protect some time. You know, when you have young kids, you got to put them to bed at a certain time. You need to be disciplined so that you have a little time at the end of the day. And yeah, you could, you'll probably be falling asleep as you pray and catch up, but God will honor your efforts. Lastly, the, the second E in serve that we're going to end on, expect then to be blessed and don't give up. All of us have hard seasons in life. Uh, there's times where our, our spouse can't give us what we need because of just life circumstances, health problems, um, they're, they're getting edu- further educated. They just got a promotion. Things are on fire at work, and they just don't have the capacity to love us the way we need them to love us for a time. And that's where the grace of God steps in, that we have this outside source in Christ to, to sustain us, and we have the family of God and brothers and sisters in Christ that we can turn to for fellowship to put that emotional support into us when our spouse can't. But we have to remember that even when we're going through hard times and we don't give up and we, we can expect to be blessed, 
if we keep pushing forward and trying, if we don't get passive and indifferent, just throw up our hands and go, what's the point? Give, and it will be given to you. Now, it doesn't always happen overnight. Things take time and process, and especially, by the way, if you find yourself today and you're in a bad place and you go, man, I wish I want to come to this sermon because my marriage is in shambles and it's falling apart, and the last thing I want to hear about is, is marriage today. I want to tell you that I, I, I hope you will trust me that if you will do the right things, even when you don't feel like it, you can get the feelings back. I promise you that God will honor your efforts even when you don't feel like it. I've seen it a hundred times. I've seen it in my own marriage. I've seen it in others' marriages. I've heard about it in testimonies and marriage, huge marriage ministries. If you will put in the work and not give up, God is there with you and he will see you through. You will reap what you sow eventually if you don't lose heart and you don't give up and you keep your eyes on Jesus and his faithfulness to you. And he can keep your heart soft and he can get you back into it. So Jesus says, listen, keep giving and, and I will give to you. And, and I love the way that uh, Luke frames it here. Press down. In other words, um, I will make more space for more giving. The more that you give, the more I will help you give. It's almost like as long as you keep giving what you're receiving from heaven, I'll just keep flowing more into your bucket to give. But if you stop and you start cutting people off from this conduit of grace and mercy and goodness and kindness, if you cut that off, I will cut off. But if you keep giving, I will keep giving and pouring out. It will be overflowed. And so in closing right now, I just want to ask you, are you focusing on what others are not doing or are you focusing on what you and do. It is such an easy trap for all of us. Focus on what everybody else isn't doing and get a little bit into pouty mode. <laughs> Woe is me. Let me tell you, that's, that's something that I've been, I've been there. And God is wanting to remind us here to look not at what others are or are not doing, but look at God and who he is and what he is for us and what he is doing and will continue to do in our lives, and then ask yourself, am I being the spouse that I want my spouse to be? How can I be asking my spouse to be somebody that I'm not willing to be? Somebody's got to take the first step. Somebody's got to pick up their cross and die for life to come back in. Am I being the friend to others that I want them to be to me? How can I sit back and expect somebody to be a friend to me that I'm not willing to be to them? We have a generous God who is full of mercy and grace and he's ready to help us get back on track if we are feeling distant from him, distant from others, distant in our homes. He says, if you will humble yourself and you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be open. Seek and you will find. Could it be that God is waiting on you when you've been sitting back passive waiting on him? You're not where you want to be today. If you're feeling distant, don't give up. God is here. He loves you. He hasn't given up on you. I want you to pray with me right now. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit <laughs> if he hasn't already spoken to you. Lord, what do you want me to get from this message today? Maybe this message just needs to be a reminder for you of your Father in Heaven's commitment to you, to serve you. We love because he first loved us. He is committed to serving your need so that you can serve your spouse's needs, so that you can serve your children's needs, so you can serve your church's needs. God is the equipper. God is the one who fills us full to overflow. It is, all begins and ends in Jesus Christ. But we play an active part in this, in participating. 
and what he is working in. So, Father, right now, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you, Jesus, that you are the way. You are the truth. This is fullness of life, that you love one another as I have loved you. I thank you, Father, that your word for us is mercy. Don't want to treat you as your sins deserve. In fact, not just in a negative sense, do I not want to treat you as your sins deserve. But I want to love you the way that Father loves me. I want to honor you the way that Father honors me. I want to invite you into this triune way of being where we are other-centered and other-focused and we are living for one another's well-being. I want you to know a new way of existence where you can truly have peace of heart and peace of mind, where there's no easy eject button, where we're in this through thick and through thin, where we're going to keep on fighting for one another when the other can't give the way we need. Where we're going to be Jesus to each other in our homes, in this church family, in this community that desperately needs to see the way of Christ. So Father in heaven, thank you for loving us. Jesus, thank you for coming and becoming one with us, that you could have compassion for us, that you know what it is to be human. You know our weakness. You know what it is to suffer. As we suffer, rejected by men, spit upon, mocked, ridiculed. And your answer was mercy. Father, have mercy. Holy Spirit, would you come and just cleanse our hearts of all that's not of you in that perfect redemptive love. Lord, you know how easy it is to get hurt and embittered and calloused and disappointed. We thank you, Jesus, that you will do what is right that you will do justly, that we can trust you, we can surrender to you as the judge, that we don't have to play the judge and jury anymore. That we can give each other the benefit of the doubt, that you've shown us the way to be at peace with each other, going directly to one another. Not expecting the worst, but showing curiosity, expecting the best, wanting the best. Thank you for your kindness and help us, Lord, to be kind. Help us to be patient. Help us to be proactive in our walk with you and each other. Help us to carry each other's burden. And on this Father's Day, Lord, you help return the hearts of the fathers to the hearts of the children where there's separation. Would you melt our hearts to see your commitment, your love for us? That you weep over us who would reject you, who wouldn't have you. That you hurt for us, that you long for us, so that we can do the same for each other. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding now, for doing your cleansing work. Would you use this closing song, Lord? to minister to us, encouragement, that as we keep our eyes on you, you're going to help us to reflect you. Thank you for giving us the mind of Christ. Help us to put it on every day and choose the way of redemptive love for the glory of your name. Amen.